Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you for coming out this evening. I really appreciate you being here, either here or online this evening. I know we have folks watching online tonight. I want to welcome you to um, tonight's event uh, surrounding our exhibit of Abraham out of one mini uh, exhibit that's finished up its first week here with the paintings around the cathedral, and we'll continue on for one more week. Tonight, I'm pleased to have um, our local author here from who has written Cowboys and East Indians. Um, Nina was born in Singapore and raised in Wyoming. She earned her MA from the University of Wyoming and her MFA at the University of Houston. Her short story collection, Cowboys and East Indians, was the winner of the 2014 Penn Open Book Award and a High Plains Book Award. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, Orion, Virginian Quarterly Review, American Short Fiction, and the Asian American Literary Review, among others. She teaches at the University of Wyoming, and in 2019 and 2020 was the Walter Jackson Bate Fellow at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard. So tonight, Nina's going to do a book reading for us, followed by discussion and some questions. And uh, welcome, Nina. Is that okay? Is there that better? Okay. Um, sorry. I'm really bad with technology. Any of my students will tell you that. Um, when when Brian first asked me about doing something in conjunction with this with this exhibit, I, I first sort of paused because I thought I don't really know how my book connects to the to the exhibit, and um, I was a little you know, I was a little unsure. And then I, I read about the exhibit and the idea that um, out of one come many. And I loved the thought about thinking about how many, you know, even though my book is not religious, thinking about the, the sort of the way that traditions work and the way that um, many different people there can be there can be commonality in things, and I think I, I write a lot about race. I write a lot about Wyoming, and um, these are questions and things I think about all the time in my writing. Um, I don't think I sit down and, and start writing and think I'm going to tackle these big issues, but um, I definitely there there are themes that come up again and again in my writing, and, and definitely um, race and sort of belonging and identity are things that um, it wasn't until I put the book together I realized were in every single story. So um, I haven't read in a long time. I haven't read from this book in a long time. Um, so I'm pretty excited to read. I'm just gonna read an excerpt um, because if I read a full story, it's way too long <laughs> and you'll be really bored. So um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna read from the story called Pomp and Circumstances. I sort of picked it for a specific reason and I'll talk about that after, um, after I, I read. So it's just an excerpt. I think um, if you wanna know what happens, I'm happy to, to tell you later, but um, I don't think it's any, any great mystery. Um, but I like it because it's sort of a Laramie story and a Casper story, so my two homes in Wyoming. Okay, pomp and circumstances. The Shirley Basin seemed to be a big stretch of nothing that fell between Casper and Laramie. There was no cell phone coverage and not many houses except a few small ranches slipped between strips of cottonwood lined creeks and the bases of rising hills. The basin at one time had been a forest, lush, tropical, a swamp. Now every summer and into fall, people combed the sagebrush and scrubbed for petrified wood for a small piece of Eden preserved. The basin is so rich with uranium that ghost towns once filled with miners lap at the edges. Low prices and oversupply has all but cut short business. In the early 90s, black-footed ferrets were released here. Once thought extinct, these little bandits thrive, feeding off prairie dogs and roaming the plains at night. 
Raja and Chitra Sen are heading across the basin to a graduation in Laramie. Their eight-year-old son, Hari, lies sleeping in the back seat. The graduation is for Raja's co-worker son, Luke Larson. Richard Larson is proud of his son and has invited everyone in the office to attend the graduation. Raja is the only one going. One, because he has never been to an American graduation and thinks it will be good for Hari, and two, because he finds Richard Larson hard to say no to. For months, Richard Larson has insisted upon calling him Senator. He has done this since he first saw Raja's name on a thin wooden nameplate on his desk, Raja Sen. Now all the other engineers in the office and even Bobby the secretary call Raja Senator. It is a nickname that sticks, that perseveres like a fossil. It is Chitra who states the obvious, Senator, didn't you tell him that you're already a king? Raja says nothing. He is the only Indian in his office. Hari is the only Indian at his school. Chitra is one of three Indians in their house. They are one of maybe six Indian families in Casper. She perhaps has it the easiest. The drive is a little less than two and a half hours and they've been silent for most of it. Raja Sen thinks his wife is rude to the Larsons as she had not wanted to come to the graduation. He thinks she's being difficult when it comes to making American friends. Raja knows Chitra has been to the Larsons house three times. One of those times they went together. It was a holiday party, an event for which they were instructed to bring a white elephant gift. Chitra had selected a soapstone elephant from a shelf in their house. On its flanks, there was an inlay of garnet colored stones. But at the party, she realized they were not to bring elephants at all. They had gone home with a plastic reindeer. When you lifted its tail, small chocolates dropped out of its behind and Hari had screamed with pleasure. <laughs> Chitra has told Raja that she has been invited to tea at the Larsons twice without him, with not just Richard but Larson, but his wife, Nancy, a thin, tanned woman who has a knack for matching outfits. She has deep set eyes and wears a great deal of eyeliner. Chitra also wears eyeliner, coal she has brought from Kolkata. Chitra's eyes look sleepy, the coal making her exotic. Nancy just looks startled. Both times the Larsons had her over, Raja was out of town. Richard Larson had planned that. They actually drank coffee and not tea. And the second time, Nancy Larson had baked. She had made a stack of lemon bars so thickly sprinkled with powdered sugar that Chitra looked as if talcum powder covered her sari. Chitra has said little about the teas, except she does not want to go back to their house again. If there is an office function, she would rather stay home. Raja is sure Chitra has done something to offend them. At the Christmas party, Chitra, who was not used to wine, told outlandish stories of India. She told Richard and Nancy Larson that hijras had danced at her and Raja's wedding, that they were good luck. Raja said, saw Richard's face as she explained them to him. Raja is sure that at the last he something must have been and said, as Richard too has not mentioned Chitra. As they drive, Chitra thinks the snow fences look like abandoned snakeskins in the grass. They curve and bend and then stop abruptly. Those wooden skeletons hold more than the skin of winter snow. Along the stretch, some ranchers use the fences to create large drifts in the basin. It gives them a ready supply of water in the spring. It's still spring now and the prairie is in a green up. Magpies lunge along the road, the smell of sagebrush is sweet. Plotting red Hereford and black Angus populate patches of the plain. They are loose stock as this is open range. Up in the hills and on Elk Mountain, which rises before them, snow still sits on the peaks, a bit like Nancy Larson's lemon bars, except underneath the peaks are rock and preserved things. Nancy lemon, Nancy's lemon bars due to high altitude baking and dry air only stay good for a day. When the Larsons first invited Chitra to tea, she was surprised to find Richard at home. The invitation had come from Nancy alone. They lived in a modest ranch house on the east side of Casper. Without all the holiday decorations, the house is spare. The living room contained a cloud-like couch. The tables had ornate legs with curving columns. There were prints on the walls of Indian warriors wearing headdresses. There were the heads of deer watching them. Richard is a good hunter and every fall fills their freezer with antelope, deer, and sometimes elk. Nancy brings Chitra a steaming cup of coffee. On the table is cream in a pitcher shaped like a cow. The cream comes out of its mouth. Do you like Casper? Have you settled, Nancy asked. Yes, said Chitra, and she meant it. Before they lived in Casper, they lived in Toronto for almost a year. Before that, they were in India. Toronto exhausted her. It was full of other Bengalis and every weekend they went to Indian party after Indian party. Parties where satellite TV blared cricket or Indian movies. Parties where all the wives would put on their best saris and, and jewelry. Parties where endless cups of tea were drunk. The talk would always be of India or the best schools to send their children. Here in Casper, they know few other Indians and in many ways it's a relief. 
She can wear jeans and cotton tops. And when they are invited to any function, she simply goes to the grocery store and buys donuts by the dozen, cookies with frosting the color of God's. Richard Larson does not join them at first. He comes in after their coffee has been drunk when Chitra is admiring Nancy's quilts, which she has spread across an overstuffed pink chair in the living room. So the senator's in Riverton. Hope he's not gambling away your fortune, Richard Larson laughs. Chitra does not know of the casino there, but she laughs along. Richard Larson takes a hard look at Chitra's sari. She had worn it because it felt polite. It is a simple one, blue rayon with a series of dancing birds on the border. I like your costume, your dress, he says. I like the one you wore to the Christmas party. She's not sure if Richard Larson is flirting or stating a fact. She had worn one of her wedding saris to the Christmas party. It was purple silk ornate with heavy gold work. It had been stiffly packed for months and so starched she felt she couldn't walk properly. Thank you. There was a quiet at the kitchen table. It was just past lunchtime. A clock in the kitchen ticked a little beat. These fabrics are very pretty, Chitra said. She pointed to the calicos and the patterns of the quilt. Yes, Nancy has an eye for color. And then Richard Larson asks her for something she could never tell Raja. He asks if he can try on a sari. By the time they hit Medicine Bow, Hari is awake and asking to stop. They pie past the Virginian Hotel, which means nothing to them, and instead go to a small gas station. The inside smells of smoke. They buy sweet coffee and chocolate and then get on the road again. Raja takes in the wind turbines outside Medicine Bow. The town is almost bordered by them, and driving to the place, they look like cartwheeling crosses, marking some sort of sacred space. He thinks he's clever to think this and begins to tell Chitra his observation, but instead tells Hari, do you see those crosses? Hari scans out the window of their Honda and says blankly, they're wind turbines. His class has been learning about green energy at school, and turbines are the newest point of contention in Wyoming. Some say coal bed methane brings up salty water and that wind turbines ruin the view that so many flocking to Wyoming crave. They look like crosses, no? There is a church near their home in Casper that has three large crosses like sentries posted outside the building. When they first drove by it, Chitra and Raja had thought they were drying clothes on one of them as purple cloth was draped on the arms like shawls. Chitra squints out the window. She sees a pump jack. And that fellow, he looks like he's bowing to Allah. Prayers abound on the prairie for them. They continue the drive the pump jack pulls up more oil. When Richard Larson asks if he can wear a sari, Nancy Larson leaves the room with a handful of quilts in her arm like a shield. You wanna see a sari? Chitra's not sure what to make of his request. Richard Larson laughs nervously. I'd like to try one on, if that's okay. He has lost the bluster she has seen in the office. He looks at his cowboy boots, which are ostrich and stippled like a pimply face. You mean Nancy wants to try one on? Chitra is still confused and wondering if this is a kind of trick. She wonders if this has something to do with Raja at work. Richard Larson is embarrassed, but then he gains back some of the bravado she has heard when he calls the house looking for the senator. It's like those people you talked about in India at the Christmas party. Um, sorry, at the Christmas party. Chitra thinks back to the holiday party. She remembers the white elephant drinking glasses, glasses of wine the color of rose water, but she doesn't catch his drift. And then she remembers her talk about hijras and how she found them happy while Raja found them a nuisance. Chitra, I'm gonna show you something. He pronounces her name, Chitra. She follows him into the basement, past a pool table and more deer watching them in a solemn line. He takes her into a room with wood paneled walls. The floor is concrete. In the room are several large safes or what Chitra thinks are safes. This is where I keep my guns, he says, pointing to a safe. Kids, I told the Senator, if he takes up hunting, he needs to get something like this. You don't want Harry there getting into guns. Nancy and Richard Larson have one other child besides Luke, a girl named Gretchen. She's in the army and stationed in Germany. There's a narrow door with a lone padlock on it in the room. Richard Larson takes a ring of keys from his pocket and opens the lock. It's a small room meant at one time as a kind of pantry. Inside is a little vanity with an oval mirror. A bench is tucked neatly in the middle. On the surface of the table is a wide array of makeup, compacts, eyeshadows that look like an artist's palette, brushes of all size, sizes, lipsticks lined up like bullets. There is a full length mirror next to the vanity. It is also oval and swivels on its, mirror, on its wooden base. A stained glass floor lamp stands in the other corner and next to it is a plush chair. But unlike the cloud chairs from the living room, this one has a Victorian feel. It's an elegant chair, light mauve with a kind of paisley pattern. It's not a Nancy Larson chair. There are framed paintings on the wall and again, they are different. They are of flowers, of English cottages with thatched roofs. But the thing that delights her most is a metal bookcase. Lined up are mannequin heads all in a row. 
On each of the heads, it's a blonde wig in various hairstyles, a straight bob, a curly bob, long Rapunzel-like hair, and a cut with layers framing the face. The mannequins line up and look like the deer heads they passed on the way into the room, watching and taking it all in. Chitra does not say anything because she is genuinely unsure of what to say. This is a condition she felt a lot in Toronto, but since being in Wyoming, she has lost this to some degree. She appreciates having not, having, not having anyone ask her why Hari is losing his Bengali, why she now cooked burgers, and didn't she know Japanese cars were the way to go. Richard Larson walks back into the room with the safes and turns the dial of one. Chitra, Chitra half expects he's gonna show her his guns as if they are similar to the display of makeup. But when Richard Larson opens the heavy door of the gun safe, it's, is it, it's, it, it is as if like he has opened a closet. Inside is a rack of dresses. They are beautiful. They are the kind of dresses she had seen on TV. The kind of dresses as a little girl in India she thought American women wore. Her biggest disappointment since arriving in Wyoming is seeing how sloppy women are. In the grocery store, she marvels at the loose sweatpants and stained winter coats most women wear. She had to give it to Nancy Larson. She is matchy, but she dresses well. But there are dresses with sequins that look like silver fishes. There are taffeta dresses in which the fabric whirls in discreet. For the most part has been quiet, says this. I'm not gay and I love my wife. Chitra nods. Nancy has known about this since we got married. That's 24 years now and she's okay with it. You have to know I'm not gay. I just like to put these things on. It's not like your country. People don't consider it lucky. Chitra touches the pink satin dress. It's strapless with a large bow on the waist along the hem is lace. She wants to explain the complexities of hijras, their place, but instead she strokes the dress. Okay, she answers. Richard Larson sees her face. Would you like to try it on? When they arrive at the graduation, they're late. They're unsure of where to park and end up walking in circles around the university campus. Chitra is wearing an orange sari and slip-on heels, and she struggles to keep up with Hari and Raja, who are both in sports coats, press pants, and ties. Do you want to go to school here? She yells up to Hari. Hari turns around and gives her a pained look. Baba says, I'll go to school in India, to IIT. Why would I go here? Chitra has no answer. She knows that school, Hari's schooling, should be her singular fo focus, and that is why she's held off on having other children. Raja wants more. She thinks of the IUD she had put in in Toronto, her secret, her own broken cartwheeling cross inside her uterus. It gives her a kind of power, an energy. When they find the stadium, they do not sit with the Larsons. Luke Larson is graduating in engineering. He will come back to Casper at the end of the summer and begin work at the same firm as Raja and Richard. The Sens sit in hardback seats and hold a program in boss of the logo of the university and inside are row upon row of names. Hari plays a pocket video game. If the ceremony is having any influence on his future academic career, it does not show. Chitra and Raja watch as speeches are given, a woman sings, and the graduates file out on the stadium floor just like a movie. As they walk, the graduates walk two by two, and in their black gowns and tasseled hats, they look like walking lamps. Their faces beam, they look fresh-faced and ready for the future. Chitra finds she's strangely happy and excited for these young people, for their accomplishments, for the future that lies before them. She follows their name in the program. She takes pictures of graduates she does not know. Chitra decides that day in the basement not to try on the dress. Instead, Richard Larson takes her back into the little room and shows her albums of himself in various outfits. When he wears dresses, he likes to be called Clara. And Clara, from what Chitra can tell, is demure. Everything Richard Larson is not. She imagines that Nancy Larson has taken these photos as most of them have been taken in, a wood, in the wood panel safe room. There are pictures of Clara in suits, in dresses, even a velour tracksuit. The only sari Chitra has is the one she is wearing, and so until she can next come over, she gives Richard Larson a taste of what wearing a sari is like. When they go back upstairs, she picks up one of Nancy Larson's quilts. It is a log cabin quilt, all in shades of blue and green. It is thick and awkward. But Chitra drapes the quilt around him in a faux sari. It will look like this, she laughs, and Richard laughs with her, those awake in the, as the weight and the bulk of a quilt are nothing like a sari. She feels amazingly light for knowing this about Richard Larson. The secret moves inside her. Nancy does not appear again on that day on the visit. Richard Larson shows Chitra out and she promises to bring back the purple sari for him to try on. Richard Larson does not ask her not to tell Raja about the request, but she knows not to. It is unspoken between them. This kind of thing can get you killed in Wyoming. 
The ceremony is long and when it's over, they meet at Luke Larson's apartment. It's near the university. The apartment is filled with other Larsons and Nancy's family who are Boyd's. The Sens are one of the first to arrive and since they have never been to a graduation party, they all sit quietly in the corner until Richard and Nancy arrive. Senator, Chitra, Harry, Richard Larson exclaims their names when he arrives. He is wearing a kind of suit with the same cowboy boots he wears most days. Around his throat is a bolo tie with a turquoise stone. He has a large elk tooth ring on his finger. Nancy Larson is wearing a flowered dress. She smiles a thin smile at the Sens. It is Roger who speaks for them. You must be so proud of Luke, such a lot of graduates, what a sight. He's genuinely happy for Luke Larson and wishes his wife would show more spirit. Yes, yes, you must all get some food now, said Richard. He doesn't look at Chitler, which disappoints her. She has picked the orange sari because she knows Richard Larson will appreciate it. Western women seem to notice the sari's color, but Richard Larson notices the intricacies of a sari, the weave, the fabric, the zari work. In fact, Richard Larson is the only person who has asked her anything beyond, are they hard to wear? When Chitra goes back to the Larsons, she brings a suitcase of saris. She has the purple one from the Christmas party, but she also packs a variety. For fun, she puts on a salwar kameez and a box of, brings a box of jewelry, which she has removed from the small safe in the cupboard in their bedroom. It also holds their passports and visas. Nancy Larson lets her in, and again, they have coffee alone. They eat lemon bars. Chitra finds herself driving the conversation, and they do not mention the purpose of her visit. You must all be missing Gretchen so far away, she asks. Yes, but we email. The clock's ticking punctuates her sentences. Nancy Larson is not a talker. Richard appears as they are finishing their coffee. This time, Raja is in Cheyenne, but will be back later that night. How do you like this weather, he asks. It's been snowing on and off for day, a few days, and the streets are a slushy mess. Chitra is still new at driving, and Richard Larson knows this. I have to get a big broom to clean the car, and I wear boots. She threw her lifts up her sari to reveal a new pair of brown leather boots. She had put on a sari especially for the visit, but she had spent the week in jeans, jeans and sweats. Suddenly, she understood the women at the grocery store. She threw motions to the suitcase. I've brought many choices. She walks over and opens the suitcase and begins to spread the saris out on the same chair. Nancy showed her the quilts. She unfolds the saris to show the palus, which are rich in decoration. She has a Kanchipuram silk sari, a hand loom sari, a blocked printed sari, saris with fake crystals affixed to them in patterns like stars. She likes showing someone her clothes. In Toronto, she worried her saris weren't fancy enough, but here, spread across the upholstery, they look sumptuous like wealth. Richard Larson takes it all in. He runs his head, hands over the silks, the cottons, even the rayons. He is quiet. It is Nancy Larson who breaks the silence. I could make a nice quilt with those, she says. The party is tedious. The first wave of family has been replaced by a second wave of Luke's friends. They are polite and well-dressed and dig into the food with glee. Nancy Larson has brought trays of cut-up vegetables and cheese from Walmart. She has made plates of lemon bars and cookies. She has a slow cooker filled with sausages. Next to the cooker is a small crystal glass brimming with toothpicks. Raja and Chitra fill their plates with crackers and pieces of carrots. No one from the party talks to them except the occasional person en route to the buffet. What a pretty costume, dress, outfit, thing you have on. And what a color, is it hard to wear? Chitra answers politely and for a moment longs for the Indian parties of Toronto. Chitra is annoyed and cannot bear Raja's stubbornness. She told him it was just tea with Nancy and that Richard came in hardly at all. They didn't drink any alcohol, but she suspects Raja thinks they did. And she, did, she didn't, but she knows Raj, Richard Larson has become nervous. He cannot gauge her ability to keep a secret and so stupidly has been silent and awkward at work. Poor Raja, he cannot imagine what his wife must have said. He worries that he may never get a promotion. The difficulty with Richard wanting to wear a sari is that all of Chitra's choli blouses are too small for him. So instead she tells him to wear a t-shirt underneath the sari. But all of Richard Larson's t-shirts are like walking advertisements for races run, political candidates, for places they have traveled. And although his shirt advertising sombrero mics and Cancun is similar in purple to her sari, it will not do. Chitra hands him the slip worn under the sari and tells Richard Larson to tie it tight. Tight, tight, almost like you can't breathe, she instructs. And after, a few minutes later, he comes into the safe room in a cotton slip and white undershirt. It is as if he is naked and for the first time, he seems embarrassed. Chitra cannot ever be, remember being told or, how to, or, or shown how to wear a sari. Perhaps she watched her mother and grandmother so many times it imprinted into her very being. Richard Larson does not just want to wear a sari, he wants to learn how to put one on, and so Chitra shows him. First you make a knot like this and tuck it in, she says, tucking the end of the silk into his waistband. 
It is the first time beyond a handshake that she has ever touched Richard Larson, and somehow feeling the soft give of his belly and seeing the paleness of his arm, she feels protective of him. She senses his vulnerability. She turns him around and adjusts the pillow over his shoulder. She pleats the fabric. Richard Larson, as an engineer, is meticulous and carefully folds the pleats into even amounts. It isn't heavy at all, he says. No, but walk carefully. Chitter takes out two large pins and discreetly pins the sari at the shoulder and at the pleats. Even I do this sometimes, she lies. When she is done, she takes a long look at Richard Larson. It's as if no, he is no longer Richard Larson, but Clara. He stands very still, as almost as if he is taking something in. I think I'll just go do my makeup, he says to Chitra, and she nods. Richard Larson takes a small step to the little door, his secret room, and then stops as he crosses the doorway. He turns around and looks at Chitra. Do you think Raja would think this looks nice? It's the first time Chitra has ever heard him call her husband anything but the senator. I think he would think you wear it very well. I'm going to stop there. Um, and if you want to know what happens in the story, the graduation party and the, um, what happens in the room, um, you can, I can tell you or you could read the book. But um, I, I, I picked this story to read and I like this story um, to read for a, lot, a few reasons. I, I wrote this story, um, it was one of the last stories I wrote when I wrote the book. I had sort of written many of the stories over years of graduate school and um, I, I was thinking about, um, not things that were missing or things I wanted to say about Wyoming, but I was, I was thinking about Matthew Shepard a lot when I, when I wrote that story. And um, I, I knew Matthew, we were two grades apart in Casper. I was, or no, one grade apart. We were only a grade apart. And um, we both went to St. Mark's together back home. Um, we both, um, I grew up going to St. Mark's Episcopal Church and um, my mom is, a very, is very devout and we would go to church every Sunday. And um, I was a very big acolyte back in the day. I wasn't a very good acolyte, if I do say so myself. I feel like I was often in my own dream world during the service, but um, which someone told me later, I looked like I was concentrating very hard during the gospel readings <laughs> and things. And I always thought, oh, am I? Um, but I always remember acolyting with Matthew because when you, would, when you would come down for the gospel, you carry torches and, um, we, you know, you get to the certain part of the pew and I always remember Matthew was very small. And so I would always have to, even though I wasn't much older than him, I would always have to hold my torch down because we would have to be even. And, um, you know, when he died, uh, it, it, it was such a, a strange time, I think for everyone in Laramie and in Casper and in, and in um, our church, because he was, a, you know, he was a member of our, his family with someone we saw, Judy and Dennis, and his family was part of our church. And um, I just remember thinking, I wanted, you know, I feel like art is the only way I know how to express. I'm, I'm actually, contrary to popular belief, I'm actually very quiet and introverted. And I think that um, art is the only way I know how to respond to things. And I thought, I just, I wanna write a story talking about masculinity in Wyoming. And I knew I didn't wanna write a story that was a typical story about writing about masculinity in Wyoming. And I thought, I just, want to talk and sort of subvert that idea that, that we think about what a man is supposed to be. And I really, um, I hate the expression cowboy up. I know a lot of people <laughs> love it, um, but I've had a lot of students that I think, I've seen a lot of students over the years where I think that that actually is kind of damaging because it says like, you have to, you have to be tough and you can't like show emotion and you have to like be really, I don't know, tough. And I feel like I've seen a lot of young men as a, as a professor and as a teacher that I think that's maybe not so good to hear all the time. I think it's okay to be vulnerable. I think it's okay to cry. I think it's okay to, to have emotion. And um, yeah, so I just really wanted to write a story that was thinking about all of those things. And I, I don't think that I typically go into writing or go into my fiction thinking I want to attack this subject or, or tackle this. Um, I often am surprised that when I read a story at the end of it thinking, oh, I guess I was thinking about that in my subconscious. But um, again, I really, with this story, wanted to talk about, I think it was a, a story that felt very deliberate to me. I was like, I want to talk about masculinity. I want to talk about the ways I think that can be very damaging, um, especially in a state where, you know, I love Wyoming, but I feel like that idea of being very macho um, is sometimes, again, a little, a little damaging. So um, yeah, I wanted to read that story tonight, partly because I was, I feel like whenever I'm in the church, I think about um, our confirmation class, <laughs> how we visited St. Matthew's as a field trip. And um, 
I barely got confirmed. I, rem I actually feel like I was ter a terrible, I, I don't think I was that delinquent as a, a youth, but I remember there was a, a multiple choice question we had to do. And it said, what is a bishop? And I put a chess piece that can move diagonally. <laughs> and I remember <laughs> my priest, our pr poor priest like looked at it, he's like, Nina, you know it's not a chess piece that can move diagonally. And I just thought, I know. But um, <laughs> that's, that's the kind of kid I was. Um, so I, I, and I also remember, I'll tell one last story and then I'll be done with my terrible, my delinquent youth, but um, we had had a lock-in in the church, which I don't know if they do those anymore, where you like stay up, I mean, it's a terrible idea. Like you stay up all night, you're like eating tons of pizza and sugar and I was there and there were a bunch of us just running around and um, I had to acolyte the next morning at, at like the 8.30 service. And I remember just being, I mean, I, ha I don't think I ever did pull an all-nighter ever until that night and I, was holding the torch, I don't even know why I didn't put it in its holder, but I was holding the torch and I completely fell asleep and just dropped my torch onto the, <laughs> dropped on the altar and like nearly started a fire. And after that, I took a little break from acolyting. So I feel like I, I always um, laugh at my misspent youth uh, in the church. But um, again, I, I wanted to talk about that in this story quite a bit. So or I wanted to think about all those ideas and things from my youth. So I think Anne's gonna come up now. And I, I invite folks here, if you have a question, uh, if you want to come up to the microphone and ask your question, and those folks that are watching, uh, uh, thank you, thank you, Nina, for, for reading. Those, those that might have a question online, if you will just type those in, and then they'll send me the question that I can ask Nina. So does anybody have any question or comments or anything that you'd like to say? Please feel free to and come And no pressure. Me. No pressure. <laughs> Um, I was curious about the technique of the two time periods mm -hmm. and how you came to that and just sort of the technical question about that. I would assume your, all your short stories don't do that usually. No. Yeah. Um, quite a few of them are just in present motion of moving yeah, yeah. linearly. Yeah, I, I don't, I'm really drawn to time more and more. I, I'm, right, I'm finishing a novel right now. Um, finishing a novel right now, almost finished with a novel right now that um, has many timelines. And I, I think I'm just drawn to writing about the past in a lot of ways. Um, that is a very distinct timeline of 1954, 1986, present day. But in this story, I, I tried to write this, I mean, I tried to write the story all just from one day of her going to the house and it didn't really work. I felt like it just didn't seem like it had the energy and I wanted something in the present that put pressure on the situation. And I feel like as a reader, I, I was like, there has to be some tension in the story. And the tension, I think the tension as a reader is just like, is Roger gonna find out at this graduation whether or not what actually happened at the house? Cause he thinks something weird is, has happened. And I think also for the reader, I know a lot of people that aren't expecting the twist that Rod, Richard wants to, to, you know, that he likes, that he cross-dresses and wears women's clothing. And I think a lot of people um, are expecting him to make a pass at her or there's some other, they think something else is gonna happen. And so I guess I kind of liked playing with the timelines because it, again, just puts tension on the story a little bit. Um, yeah, and I, 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 you know, I had so many versions of the end of the story as well, like where, and I had versions where the little boy was with her when she was at, the house and it did, I, I didn't like that either. I felt like he was actually too extra, <laughs> took him out. But um, yeah, I, I like the idea of going back and forth more, mostly for tension, I think. The idea of putting sort of pressure on the story, I guess. We have a question online. Um, how did Matt's murder change you and, uh, and Judy Shepard's response? Did, how did that change you or did it? I mean, I think it, well, I know it changed me. I mean, I think it changed so many things. I, I think, to begin with, I think, I mean, this sounds terrible to say this, but I think I'd always felt like the othering had, for me had always been about race and I hadn't thought about other ways that people are othered. And I think, um, you know, I was quite young when he, I was 20, 23 when he, when he passed away. So I wasn't, you know, I think for me, I, I hadn't thought about, I mean, I had a lot of gay friends in Wyoming, but I think for me, a lot of them, I did not know one that was out in high school. Um, absolutely not. I mean, it, 
it was not a shock to me. Well, it was a little bit of a shock to me at my 20th high school reunion to realize how many people in my class were gay that did not feel comfortable to, to be open. And, and I remember at that time also teaching at the university. Um, I was teaching my very first graduate classes as a graduate student um, and knowing, um, again, like I didn't know how to talk about that murder with my students. Like I didn't know how to talk about difference with my students. I didn't talk, know how to talk about anything that seemed contro controversial, I didn't, I was scared to talk to about in my, in my classroom. And I think that murder changed my fear because I all of a sudden realized like, by being silent, you're being complicit. Mm -hmm. You're being, you're, you're, you're not, um, I, I just felt like that, that changed for me as, as a teacher. I think it absolutely changed for me as a teacher. I think I 100% after that thought, if these subjects aren't talked about in the classroom, where, where are we going to talk about it? So for me, um, I think as a teacher, that was a real watershed moment for me to realize like I have, we have to talk about these things. And, you know, now 20 years later, over 20 years later, um, it's so interesting how open so many of those subjects are and not always, but how much better it is than it was a while ago. Right. And I just, Judy, I think is, I think she's just an amazing human being. I mean, yeah. she took, what is the worst moment and the worst thing in your life that could ever happen to you? And, you know, she's, I don't know if you could say, you know, made good of it, but she's, she's, she's changed a lot of young people's lives. And, and I think done a lot in Wyoming to, to make the subject and um, just, I don't know, let, let a lot of, again, a lot of people not live in fear the way they were. Sure. Other questions here? As a teacher, there's always that silent, like pause where people are, shall we ask? On Zoom, it's even worse. <laughs> like, yes. The awkward pause. Of... So another question online, I think it's a question. Nina, loved your book. I'm wondering how it was growing up in Wyoming when kids found out your mother is from India. I always enjoyed socializing with your parents when you were in elementary school and I'm glad we reconnected. It's Nancy McCammon Hanson. Oh, yeah, her husband was. Um, uh, you know, um, I think, you know, first of all, I mean, I play with this a little bit in my book. I think Indian is a funny word in Wyoming because it's loaded with a lot of, a lot of um, thought towards more indigenous peoples. And for, a, as a kid, I would definitely um, dress as a, I, I mean, I think back now and I want to cry because it's so culturally appropriating, but I, I often was um, a rabbi or Shoshone for Halloween or, or various other things because I just thought I, I, it, I associated with it because I felt like I was Indian in a funny way. Um, so I would sometimes tell people I was, I don't know why I would tell people, it would just seem easier to tell people I was indigenous or Native American rather than Indian Indian because that seems such a complicated thing to explain. Um, but I think growing up Indian in, in Casper was, I mean, it was fine. I think, you know, it's just, I think one thing about when you're a color in Wyoming is just every room you go into, there's usually, you just never see a reflection of yourself. And mm -hmm. I feel like that is something I'm very used to at this point. Um, but sometimes it can also be tiring. <laughs> you just think, okay, like, I'd love to see another, another person that looked like me a reflection of myself. Um, and I'm very aware of that now because I have a daughter and I, I think about what she sees and I think I want her to, and, and Laramie is better than a lot of places, I mean, mm. in terms of diversity, but um, my students tell me that and I sometimes laugh because I'm like, it's not that diverse, but um, comparatively, you know, if you're walking around the UW campus, it, you do see people of color. Right, right. Growing up in Casper, uh, myself, um, other for me was the other kid that had the really strange haircut. Mm -hmm. um, everybody else looked like me. So um, <laughs> that's, that's what I grew up with. Um, another question, would you consider coming to Northwest College in Powell to do a reading presentation? <laughs> Gosh, I have done one there. in Powell a few years ago. It was, it was great, great actually. Uh, beautiful facilities there. Um, I mean, I love going around the state. I, I feel like um, it's always interesting because I, I do a lot of book clubs around the state and people, a lot of my friends are like, why do you do book clubs? Like that seems like a joke. Like, that seems like a lot of work for, I don't know. But I really like, I like doing book clubs. I like talking to people that, I mean, I've gone to a lot of book clubs where I've, the group has been 
white. And a lot of them have said to me, like, I've never thought about race in Wyoming. And I think, well, yeah, you haven't had, you haven't had to right. think about race in Wyoming because right. you're, you don't have to. You don't have to. And, um, and so I'm always kind of happy to go around and talk about, I don't know, I think, you know, there are a lot of people of color in Wyoming. I mean, not a lot, but there are people of color. There are people that are different. I mean, there are many ways to be othered. I think mm -hmm. um, we're not all one cowboy. I don't know, like the stereotype of all one cowboy sure. thing. Sure. I and you mentioned this. I when I when I read the book, I in my mind, all the stories were going to be about um, uh, Indians and Wyoming, mm -hmm. and then the story you read tonight, just realizing that we're, we, we're not only other by the way we look, mm -hmm. but some of the mannerisms and behaviors that we have that living in Wyoming, many of which we keep secret mm -hmm. and all the different things that we might keep secret because of how other people might feel right. or treat us. And, and I've got to ask you this question because it's from your mother. Are you going to offer to acolyte at St. Matthew's? You know, she has said that a few times, and I've said no every time. I've been like, I would need to be retrained, but uh, no, I, I would not act like I, I, I'm terribly, still probably delinquent. We could put the torches away. Oh, God, life. yeah. I mean, the clang of that hitting the altar, I'll never forget. Woke me right up. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I, ha I haven't read the book. Now I want to. Um, <laughs> but I wanted to come back to the theme of um, vulnerability and... Um, it got me thinking, hearing part of the story, I don't know how it ended, but is that um, being, being willing to be vulnerable, is that a path to crossing the lines between differences and, and other? And, and yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess I'd like to think there was a happy ending to the story. There is, if they happy ending. Together. <laughs> okay. Everyone's but good. If, if you could just, yeah, talk about the role of vulnerability in bringing people together. Yeah, I mean, I think, I guess I myself, I mean, I, people like Brene Brown and speak about vulnerability so much more beautifully than I do, but I think um, vulnerability to me just, I feel like that's the only way you know people. I, I feel like when people, again, when you cowboy up or have this bravado, you don't see people's true self and be vulnerable. And I, I guess I'm very willing to be very vulnerable to people and say my faults and say the things that are, um, I, I, I don't know, I don't, and I think vulnerability brings empathy. And I think, um, I believe so strongly in being empathetic. And I think that, um, I don't know, I, I, I just, I, I, I I, I feel like in writing a character like Richard Larson, who starts with a lot of bravado and like, he's such a showboater and he's so, um, she thinks of him as one way, but like, you know, clearly he has this other part of his life that is so important to him and, and he's willing to share it with this person that he actually doesn't really know very well. Um, because, you know, she talked about, hij so hijras and for any of you that don't know, they're a third gender in, um, in India. They're not considered men, they're not considered women. Um, when you see a hijra, they're um, typically men, and they're originally they were. My mom probably will correct me, but they, a lot of them were eunuchs, and they wear women's clothing. I mean, they certainly do wear saris, and they wear they have long hair, but um, they're brought in for various. Um, they're often at weddings, dancing, and and you, they travel in usually groups, and um, they they also can curse you, you can or you, they can bless you. You can have like good luck from a hijra or bad luck, um, and you know. Chitra is very empathetic to them. Like a lot of people don't like them. They are kind of frightened of them as a group. I don't, I've known people that really are annoyed by them. Um, and I think I like the, I liked the idea that she was sort of, again, just a very empathetic person. And um, I also just feel like I like writing vulnerable characters than people that, I think people that um, are performative and always have a side of themselves that isn't, you don't really know them. You're like, who are, who are you? Um, so I appreciate vulnerability. So I think I think I tend to write characters that are that way hmm. a lot. <laughs> Hi, Nina. Hi. Thanks for this reading. Thank um, you. I don't know if this is way off base. Am I too close? But um, I was really um, 
What really caught my attention was when you talked about the furniture as being very Victorian and like the, the pictures of the English countryside. And um, I know there's a very complicated and oppressive past between Victorian and England and um, in India. And I'm wondering if that was conscious or maybe you could talk about that. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think that was a little bit of a nod to like a lot of my family in India and a lot of Indians I know when I lived in India, a lot of that, it's, it's strange because I think there is such a complicated history of colonialism and, and the British in India, it, it's a complicated past. I don't, there's, I mean, that is, colonialism is, is so complicated, but yet there's also a strange admiration for a lot of very English things. And I think that, you know, when you see school children in India, they still are wearing very much like the British school uniforms. It, the, the system is still very much the British system. Um, when you go into any, uh, this fascinated me, but like when you go into any bookstore in India, the two major authors that are often, they have literally their own sections in every Indian huge bookstores, like the equivalent of Barnes and Noble would be Agatha Christie and um, Enid Blyton, who was a children's book writer who wrote very British children's stories. And, um, you know, they're still read massively today. Like people love that sort of, I mean, I think Agatha Christie completely, I mean, her stories are set in Iraq and Baghdad and like, you know, she, she went all over the Orient, the Orient. Um, so I, I think I was thinking about that Chitra would notice those, she would like those paintings more and she would like those things more than the sort of deer heads and very like modern furniture, I think. And also I wanted to make Richard very separate from his wife. I feel like she had the upstairs of the house and that everything was there was clearly her, I guess, except for the deer head. Um, but I wanted to have the down, like I wanted to have his space. You can kind of see that he actually is a very different person from his wife. And I wanted to make, I guess I wanted to sort of say that um, and make them very different. But I think that probably was a subconscious thing because you'll go into a lot of like Indian houses and they use Yardley English soap or they, there's just so many like holdovers of, of, at least with my family, but my family also in India, they were, they went to Church of England. They were, they were, um, they weren't Hindu. So I think that also, you know, even more so the English influence was there. My mom's probably dying to correct me right now. <laughs> See if she has. I know she probably will. <laughs> So I had met you, Nina, years before I read your book, and I couldn't help with each story and each character wondering um, if there's a specific um, either experience or character that you feel really represents um, or expresses you as Nina throughout the book. Yeah, I mean, I think I have two answers to that question. I think one thing is, you know, when you're writing short stories, you're writing them over a period of time and you're not putting them together and thinking of them as a collection. And it was only when I put it together the first time for my thesis. Um, and then maybe a couple, two years later, I was here back in Laramie teaching and I was trying to put the book together in a book book. And um, I noticed that every story that was a young woman was told in the first person point of view. So it would be like some, I, I don't like if it was a young adopted girl or confused young woman or I, they were all first person. But every time it was a story about like someone set in India from India, like this story, or uh, I had a white main character, they were always in third person. And I, I just must have subconsciously put that distance there like a little bit. I have one story set on a rig and it's a, it's a man as the narrator. And my dad's a geologist and he works on many rigs. So I mean, I know that world really well, but I think there was some part of me that just distanced. But it is funny because I think all the first person stories are very much me trying to work out identity quite a bit. And um, I, right when the book came out, I did a talk at Stanford, which was very overwhelming because the students were very smart. And these two young women got up and did a presentation on my book before I spoke. And I literally started taking notes on things they were saying. I was like, oh, that's very smart. Like I literally started taking notes because I was like, I didn't know I was doing. I mean, it was just so fascinating to hear, but they talked a lot about how like I have clothes in every single story. Um, and they were like, there are people wearing clothes, taking off clothes. Like there's always cl clothes. And I, and I, like, I, I didn't, notice that but I guess you know clothes are the quickest way you have identity so it made sense that that was I guess in every story but I just I didn't even think about it and um it was really fascinating to hear them talk about like clearly these are like stories of like 
confused, like, <laughs> confused woman. And I was like, yeah, that's probably right, I guess. Like, <laughs> that would be me, I'm confused. Um, you know, it helped, writing the book helped be less confused, I think, for me, at least. I think making art, for me, makes me feel less confused, you know, feel better. Hmm. Try it anyway. <laughs> Other questions here? Nina, thank you so much for sharing your reading today. Um, I think the, at least of the excerpt that you had shared, I haven't read your book, but I most certainly will now. Um, I feel the stories of vulnerability um, touch really deeply with my own heart. And um, the ways in which I feel stories of vulnerability have been expressed in like modern film anyway, mm -hmm. it's very gloss, glossy and very happy. And it seems like there's no points of conflict. Like people are just fully embracing of like, right. whoa, you're open about all these, <laughs> these things. And wow, we're fully accepting. And that's just not particularly how our society is. And so I find it's so, so interesting, um, Nancy's character mm -hmm. in this. So if you could maybe describe your intentionality behind Nancy and maybe his, her relationship with Richard. Yeah, I mean, I, I should say that the bones of this story are based on a true story. Um, and so I knew a couple that this was the case, or, or that I just, though he was quite open about it to everybody, I should say, and it wasn't a, it wasn't a secret. Um, and I think I wasn't as fascinated with him. I was fascinated with her. I thought, you know, um, because he was living his truth and being very open and like, and I, I wanted to make this story that, I didn't want it to be open in the story. Um, I, I don't know why I chose to make it more quiet, but I, I think about love and love in its various forms. And, and I think, um, I mean, I haven't been married that long myself, so I don't know that I can answer this 100%, but I think, you know, marriage is very accepting of other, like you accept that person and you accept who they are as a person, you hope. And I, I feel like she, throughout the story, she's very peripheral. She doesn't, though there is a scene where they all, she puts Nancy in a sari too, when she puts Richard in a sari and Nancy sort of gets into it a little bit more, but um, she's pretty much on the side. She takes pictures and like, that's it. And I think actually the tension of the story at the graduation is at one point in the graduation, she hands Raja the camera, it's a digital camera. This was, obviously the story is dating itself now, but it would be a phone, but um, she hands Raja the camera and, and you think she hands it as a mean thing. Like she wants Raja to like look back and look at the, picture, like look at the pictures of them in the, and give the secret away. But um, it isn't, I mean, Raja doesn't end up looking back in the photos. He doesn't see, he doesn't know by the end of the story, he still is in the dark. And, um, you know, I, I figured, I tried to figure out different ways and I didn't want to make her a mean character. I wanted to make her just, you know, this is her husband and this is who he is and she loves him and that that's okay. You know, and I, I didn't, um, I don't know, I guess we all have secrets that our spouses know or our partners know. And um, yeah, so I, 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 I struggled with her a little bit because I didn't know whether to make her more prominent or make her more talky. And I, 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 in the end, I felt she should be kind of in the background, but because I think Richard seemed like a big character, but um, but I also like love that she loves that about her husband too and is okay with it. Like, you know, or at least in my mind she was in creating the story. I don't know how the real life <laughs> situation panned out 100%. Now in the end, she tried on a sari mm -hmm. and they took pictures and that yeah. for me was, that was my favorite part yeah. because then they were, Having because fun. before he was down there and she was always up yeah. and there was a separation and you were doing what you're doing and I'll be up here. But when they, when they together that to me, that showed that relationship and that acceptance, um, real acceptance of. And she tries on a Western her. dress and is very excited about it. Yeah. Like in the story, she's very excited to try on like a prom type dress and be very like, um, because like, that's pretty novel too, like for her. And so I, I wanted that like, um, yeah, I thought that's just as equally pretty weird to her, like to, to wear a fancy dress. Thank you from somebody online. Thank you for reading. <laughs> Thanks. Any other questions here for Nina? 
Hi, Nina. Hi. Um, so you got your MFA at the University of Houston. Mm -hmm. I was wondering how your time in Texas influenced writing this book. Um, and I think I have, I mean, I used, uh, I used to think it was easier actually to leave Wyoming to write about Wyoming. Like I was, I had this like James Joyce thing in my head, like he had to go to Paris to write about Ireland. And, um, but then I actually found I actually write really well in Wyoming. So I've come back, I like, I like being here to work. Um, but I think I specifically went to Texas because um, I wanted to work with an Indian writer. And I think that is something that um, I had been in a lot of, I had done an MA here, which they didn't have an MFA at that time. And, um, it was great and I love Alison Hagee helped very much the beginning shaping of the book. Um, but I really felt for myself, I wanted an Indian woman in particular to help me write the book. And um, Chitra Deva Karuni is uh, Banerjee Deva Karuni. She, she teaches at the University of Houston. So I feel like Houston was the very first time I ever lived somewhere where there was a huge Indian community. And um, there's, a, like, there's a little India there and, um, especially the suburbs of Houston are just so many Indians. And um, I was just really excited to like live in a place where I could like get Indian food on the regular and like, um, you know, go to concerts and music. And, and I, I love classical Indian music, um, love it, love it. And I, um, that's hard to hear in a lot of like, mostly Bollywood type things. So that was really great about being in Houston. But um, it also was also very, unnerving to me because it was the first time I had been in a place where there, a lot of, there were a lot of Indians, but I didn't realize how they segregate. And I think for me, um, because there's so few of us in Wyoming, we don't care if you're, which group you're in, but there it was definitely like the Gujaratis hung out, the Gujaratis, the Punjabis hung out, the Punjabis, we're Tamil, so the Tamilians hung out, the Tamilians, like it was just very interesting, the Bengalis hung out, Bengalis, like I did not realize how much they segregate. And of course they do because the language is completely different for every group. And um, here in Wyoming, we always end up speaking English because there is no, I mean, most people, like my mom, Hindi is not her first, I mean, she doesn't speak Hindi that well, she's, she's Tamil. And so um, it was also a little bit of a shock to me like to realize like actually to be Indian in Wyoming is better because we all hang out together. <laughs> like everybody at the university, we all like do potlucks and groups and there it was like, you're not part of our group, you know, and it, it was a little bit strange to me to realize how much they segregate. Um, so that was a little bit of a reality check, actually, mm -hmm. um, to realize, oh, just because we're all brown, we don't hang out. <laughs> so, uh. um, so a question online. Many people who have read your book ask me if this is somewhat autobiogra autobiographical. Growing up in Casper as a child, did you feel like the other? Yeah, I did. I mean, every classroom I was in, I was the only non-white person, except my, me and my sister. We went to St. Anthony's as kids. Um, I, my nickname at Toronto County High School in high school was Mino, because I was the only minority in my class. Oh. <laughs> and, um, there were very few of us of color, and um, I accept, I don't know what, I mean, again, in retrospect, I'm like, why did I accept that as my nickname? But I think when you're in high school, you just thought, oh, I have a nickname, that's cool. And, um, and at, again, at my 20th reunion, I had multiple people come up to me and say, I'm so sorry, I called you that in high school. And I was just like, no, it's okay. I mean, I accepted it in high school. So yeah, I did feel very, I did feel very other. And I feel, I feel, I also had an amazing time in Casper too. I don't want to like negate that. I had a lot of fun in high school. I had a lot of, really good times, but I also felt very other. Um, mm. And it's just, I mean, you look at all my group pictures of like track and very, I mean, you can find me in five seconds. <laughs> like I'm, I'm the only brown face. Um, and, you know, I didn't go to a small high school. My high school had 1500 people in it. It's not a tiny high school. So, um, you know, I, I do look back. Though my sister would say the exact opposite because we have very different personalities. and she was very popular and was in like student council. And I, I think I was more nerdy. And so maybe I felt those things stronger, but she was like a cheerleader. I mean, she had a great time in high school. So she would probably disagree with me <laughs> completely on the assessment. Uh, another question online, you're writing, um, you're writing coming out of the COVID pandemic. My question to you, how much of the return to normalcy, like riding a bike and to what degree will normal be different, awkward or modifying to your literary output and general outlook? Post-war writers carry the mark when writing from their ravaged homelands on subjects. Do you have any feeling on how you've been affected? It's 
are so I think it's too soon to say. I, I, I teach a lot of writing and actually last night in my graduate workshop, it was the first story I've read of, we had the first story that was a COVID story. And she, the woman who presented it was, was a little nervous. And she said, is it too soon? Is it, should I not be writing about this yet? And I was like, well, we're all living through it right now. So I think it's fine to write about it. Um, and other workshops, I have people writing about various things. I think for me, I haven't written about it yet. Um, but I think that's partly because I also had a child this past year. So I don't think everything about this past year is like the baby. But, um, you know, I, I'll be very interested. I feel like there hasn't, I think, especially for a lot of generations, maybe 9-11 would be the closest thing, but there hasn't. I think for a lot of younger people, there hasn't been a collected trauma like of this, this past, like a war. That, and so I think this is the first thing in a while that's come along that I think it'll be very interesting to see the kind of art mm. and the kind of things that will come out of it. I think it will be, um, cause this has been a really hard year. I mean, at least for me, it's been a really hard year. I've been really lonely. I've been really down. I feel like not, I mean, it's really lovely to sit in a room with people tonight. Um, I hate Zoom. I, I have another Zoom meeting, I'll probably cry, but um, we all have to do it, right? So it's just, um, I think that um, I'll be really interested to see the art that comes in the essay, especially essays. I don't really write nonfiction as much, but um, I think there'll be some beautiful things that come out of this, I hope. Yeah. And perhaps even the ability once they can actually come out and do things yeah. to even really embrace being able to do that. I didn't realize how much I missed art this last year, but I miss going to concerts. I miss going to museums. I, miss, yeah. I didn't even think I did those things that much, but I didn't realize, you know, going to readings, just seeing people, like, I don't know, just interacting with, it's not the same online. Um, yeah. yeah. Maybe one last question or two. I don't yeah. know how long I should be talking. <laughs> Nina, thank you so much. What a great reading. Thank you. Um, what I was curious about while I was reading your book is a couple of situations that you talked about, and I'm just so curious about what, where you're coming from when you read it, like Delia, oh. <laughs> Delia who sews, and then the cow is hanging, or I mean, sorry, the antelope or whatever it is, deer, mm -hmm. is hanging in the, over the patio, and she looks <laughs> at the eye, and then the family that she, uh, that the young woman stays with when she goes abroad uh, and the the toy that the boy carries around. So, the, you know, talk about those, what those was going ones. on in your imagination. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Thank I, you. I, I think like for me, when people ask, is it like, are these autobiographical stories? I always say like, or what in my world, I always say there's always elements of some, I think as a writer, I think anyone who's a writer, like, or an artist or, you know, even photographer, I mean, you're always like looking at things and kind of clocking them and like noting them down. And I feel like um, the story that you're, the first story that you talked about, um, that was based, so in the story, it's about a woman who's trying to win a dress a doll competition at, at a bank. It's not even like high stakes, but she really wants, and she's making like a little leader hosen for her doll. And an Indian woman ends up winning, which she finds infuriating because literally it's like a piece of, she says the sorry is like, gift wrapping a doll. She doesn't think it's like actual <laughs> sewing or craft. Um, but that was based on literally my mom entered a, a dress a doll competition in a bank years ago. And I, I remember going to the bank with her and I don't remember if there was anyone bitter about her winning, but I remember her doll. She did literally like wrap the doll right before, but my mom's like going to kill me now. But she literally like wrapped some fabric around the doll right before I went, put a like spot, you know, bindi on its head and, that, and she won. And I remember thinking like, oh, she didn't do much work, but, um, that story kind of stuck in my head and I, I, I didn't want to make the main character, I tried to do a version where the, the main character was an Indian woman, but then I thought, I kind of want to, I want to see how other people look at Indian people in the story. And so, and that other story you brought up is also, the narrator is a white woman. And I think I, I, there's so like, when I lived in India, there were so many things about living in India that were so strange and hard, actually. I mean, I'd been to India many times before I lived there, but I'd always gone with family or I'd always gone, I hadn't worked, I hadn't lived there like a normal person. And I, my first few months in India were awful. Like I thought this was like the most like traumatic experience of my life because, you know, just basic daily things like getting gas and water and like the, tra coming from Wyoming, the traffic absolutely overwhelmed me. I, I could I remember standing at a street corner trying to cross the road for like half an hour. I was like, I can't, there's no stop of the traffic. Mm. And I, 
it was so disorienting for me, but I think I needed to write a character that was even more removed from Indianness because I think I was a little embarrassed that some of that was hard for me. And I do have a story where there is an Indian girl going back to, and living in India, but I think, you know, that story, I met a lot of people that were in India under the auspices of church related things and were missionaries. And I had very mixed, I'm not gonna lie, I had very mixed feelings about missionary work. I felt like I, it felt like a slippery slope to me about some things because there are a lot of aspects about Hinduism that our family still practices. We, we, we celebrate Diwali, we celebrate certain holidays and yet I'm very Episcopalian in other ways. Um, and I, it was strange to see, I don't know, I, I felt some uncomfortableness with that. So I wanted to write a story sort of around a church and, and sort of thinking about church. Um, so they're all these little tidbits of things. And, and I also, I mean, that story, in the story, the woman gets some prescription drugs. And um, that was based on a true story. I was on a drug. I was on a Accutane for bad skin here in the United States. And it was $1,500 a month. Mm -hmm. And um, I needed another course of it. And I couldn't afford it. And um, in India, it's $11 a month. Oh, and so wow. I self-prescribed myself it, which is not a good thing. I mean, it's terrible that you can go. I mean, it's kind of bad that you can go into a pharmacy mm -hmm. and ask for anything and they'll give it to you. But I, you know, I was really vain and desperate <laughs> so so i in my mind i was like i want to write a character that goes to india for medical tourism because i know a lot of people that go to india for a hip replacement or a knee replacement because why not you could have it 10 times cheaper than america and relax in a five-star hotel to recuperate so why not so um yeah i think that was just something i saw a lot in india that year and so i was curious whenever i'd go to a five-star you'd see someone recuperating not that i went to five stars very often but you'd see someone recuperating by the side of the, the pool and you think, what is their story of how they got here? And who are they? Who are they? <laughs> so, yeah. So I was thinking about all those things. I keep a notebook of like, I find sometimes I find a notebook of notes I've made. I'm like, I don't even know what that means or what I was thinking, but okay. <laughs> Somehow that was going to go in a story. Any other questions here? Yeah, I don't want to take up your night. But... Is it your novel you're writing now, can you tell us what that is or is that a secret? No, we'll it, it's not a huge secret. <laughs> I'll ever finish it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's set in, it's mostly set in Casper in the 80s, um, though I've changed the name because I've decided, I've learned that Wyoming people fact check you way too much <laughs> on things. And I, I've been corrected by many a person who would be like, you can't see that mountain range from over there. I'm like, oh, okay. I'm a fiction writer. <laughs> I don't have to be right. but. Um, yeah, so it's set in a town. It is Casper, but I, I've given it a fake name just because I don't want to. I don't want to be fact checked. Um, but yeah, it's about two actually two girls who who um, they actually commit a murder, and so a lot of the book isn't. It isn't so much who done it. You know, they've done it from the get go, um, and it's sort of backtracking through this family to figure out what happened and why they did it. Um, it sounds very bleak when I say that, mm -hmm. but um, it's it's not totally bleak. But it, it's. Um, yeah, it's a little weirder. It's a little more experimental um, than this book. And um, I've been drawn here. I mean, some of you know, like I'm drawn to writers that write really lyric and kind of weird stuff lately. And so it's, it's definitely a weirder book. I don't know. Um, and it's been really hard to write. So <laughs> I'm really glad that it's going to be out of my hands soon, I hope. Nice. Yeah. Good. We'll see. And, and, and this book you can purchase through <laughs> any of your favorite bookstores. Yeah, I buy believe. from a bookstore, not from Amazon. <laughs> buy, buy two. Um, be, before uh, we, we, we close tonight, I did want to let everybody know that with the, the art that we have uh, around here, um, each three different artists, uh, um, Muslim, a Jewish person, and a Christian, painted these. And um, the... Islamic artist, um, they didn't talk to each other before they did this, but it was about the other and how they could all embrace each other's religion and the commonalities uh, when they painted these. The um, uh, Islamic artist and the Jewish artist, the Jewish artist was from um, uh, uh, Israel and Islamic artists wouldn't work together with somebody from Israel. Another Jewish person, fine, but not somebody from Israel. But he went ahead and did it anyway. And he did say that he lost three friends because he had painted oh, 
paintings at the same exhibit as somebody from Israel. So interesting to put the art out there and to really put themselves out there knowing that what they're doing and the statement they're making could really cost you some friendships, but then realizing well, were they friends, I guess, yeah, right. if you're willing to lose that. So, but um, the cathedral's open from 12 to two, um, Monday through Saturday to come and view and read about each of these paintings and, and what they mean. Fascinating um, of, of how they came up with the idea, the artistic, getting the, the ideas of cross, of otherness and getting along um, from 12 to two, uh, Monday through Saturday and six to 8 p.m. for the next week. Um, and then also next Friday, Plugs yeah, in here. Plug it. Next Friday, we'll have a, a Sufi group coming from uh, New York that's going to play in the cathedral, playing Sufi music for us. It's an ensemble of three, um, playing the old instruments and talking about the instruments and, and music. So please, uh, we'll be open for that. We'll also broadcast that. And of course, um, I do want to thank the Episcopal Diocese of Wyoming for helping to bring this here and the um, Humanities of the Arts, Wyoming Humanities um, Council. Council? For um, for helping out with that as well, and I and I sincerely want to thank Nina thank for coming you. tonight. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much.